Mr. Shroff, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Abhinav. I want to start with your own journey. You've been in the practice for more than 40 years, out of 25 of which you've led this company. I'd love to understand from your perspective what it's been like to be a leader, to lead Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas into a new era, and over the years, the lessons that you've learned about leadership and law and just being with people? That's a great question, Abhinav. Um, and firstly, uh, on the 42 years and of which about 27 years have been in a leadership position, um, I think they've been a great blessing. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to Destiny for having given me this opportunity uh, and having effectively been able to reinvent the firm multiple times. And as I do a little bit of a flashback on life uh, and this career, uh, many leadership lessons stand out. Because leading a large organization is this is not merely about lawyering, but it is about a lot of other things uh, as well. I think I've enjoyed the uh, interactions with people. Uh, by nature, I am a bit of a builder, so I've enjoyed uh, creating a huge talent pool and many careers. Uh, each of those careers would be a part of my legacy as well, because uh, whether I'm there or not, the values that I have been able to share and, and imbibe uh, in a number of tall professionals will survive me. So I'm very proud of, of that, but as I, uh, try to answer your question on what are some of the leadership lessons I've learned. Let me summarize a few of them. So first and foremost, I believe that we have to be clear about the why of what we do. And the why has always been something which has been a bigger uh, theme for me than the what and the how. Uh, we, I reflect a lot on, you know, why does this firm even exist? Uh, and it's there is a purpose to it. I mean, we I think we fulfill a purpose. Um, you know, some of our clients and well-wishers have said that this firm is like a national treasure uh, as well. And I think considering how long we've been around, almost 107 years, uh, and having been around uh, in so many situations, both before and after independence, gives you a certain authenticity. So we defined our purpose statement as really about producing the finest lawyers for a just world. That is what drives us as well. And our values, and I'll come to that separately as well. So first point I think is, uh, as, I, as a lesson, uh, leadership lesson, I think you'll be very clear about the why. The second lesson I've learned, and especially in a people's business, is that you have to lead with your heart. Uh, and of course you need heart and mind both, but uh, to really build an institution, you primarily have to lead with your with your heart because you're dealing with people. Uh, the mind is the kind of more technical side, and I think you of course need that. That's a the base stake, uh, but it's it's uh, it's mostly about the heart and the emotion. It takes me to my third point that really institutions, whether they are uh, you know business institutions or uh, professional service firms like ours. The foundation is actually an emotional one. Uh, everybody has multiple options as well. But if that emotional glue exists and you have to actually, you know, do something in terms of your career and your, your actions to make people believe it, that is what creates stickiness uh, with people. Uh, the fourth lesson, I think, for a leader is, um, and I'm being a little mischievous here, uh, you have to drink an ounce of poison okay. every day. Uh, it's a it's a leadership lesson from from Shiva uh, because every day there's a new ball that is bowled at you. Uh, no two days are the same, and uh, it, it, there is a, you know there there's the good and the bad. Uh, so I think uh, you know just the ability to absorb adversity and be resilient is very important. You can't be a leader other than because you actually take. Uh, you take a lot of the pressure of the system and only a leader can and should sort of do that. The fifth, and I can go on and on, but I, uh, the fifth one I would say is that uh, for a long-lasting institution, 
like ours uh you have to be always moving with the times uh unless you are uh, constantly refreshing yourself it's very difficult to stay ahead i mean look at even your organization it's also you know of great vintage and you continue to remain both dominant and relevant because you are inventing and reinventing all the time uh you can have a long history but unless you are constantly fresh you're not relevant to the customer so these are at least some of the lessons i can as i said i can go on and on but five of them which really stand out for me wow that's quite an incredible set of lessons to learn you know even at toi we have this saying that we're not a 186 year old company we're a 186 year young startup and i think to have that mindset also defines a lot of moving with the times which is what you said i want to dig deeper on institution building you know you've been at this for decades and institution building is a lot like cathedral building also the people who built cathedrals never got to see them how do you build effective great incredible and lasting institutions so it's about the value system uh, so i mean in fact just yesterday i was having this chat with some of my partners in terms of you know the individual and the brand you will find very few examples but there are of 200 year old brands and you are almost that uh, but the mortality of their leaders for the time being you know takes you up to a particular point so part of what we need to think about is what is it that you can create in terms of making your brand timeless uh, and that will survive you so institution building is about really building the intangible uh, which survives you everything else will change your in re- uh, real estate infrastructure will change your people will change your maybe your clients will change but there is something about long lasting institutions and particularly brands that last forever so i i use an accounting term for it and i may literally use it 10 times every day is how do you build your balance sheet and how do you on the on the balance sheet what are the appreciating assets that you build every day uh and i think they are all intangible they are your value system they are your approach uh, and philosophy they are how you treat knowledge knowledge is very very important because at the end of the day an organization like us what are we vending we are vending knowledge so you have to make of course people but also more importantly you have to put knowledge at the center of the organization for the which is kind of gives you a little bit of the raison d'etre for for existence as well so there are many uh, lenses which you could use for institution building but i think it's ultimately about the value system and you might have seen it on our email signature in terms of what our three values are and it came as a response to a question where a few years ago we asked ourselves the question of why do we even exist and what would the world have missed had amar chand been not been there and we came up with three words character competence and commitment these these are the three things that we stand for and which we try to demonstrate in our dealings every single day both internally and externally you know we've talked a bit about how we can lead better and what are the general leadership lessons from all these years we've talked about building institutions and you talked about value systems i'm also curious about you personally and your journey you know going through a series of important cases important periods in the firm's history 107 year old history and just generally also being in the practice and seeing how the legal field in india has evolved to a very different extent would love to understand some of the lessons that you have learned along the way and the skills that you think have been important for you over the years so there are table stakes i think good lawyering technical knowledge i think is our table stakes if you are not a good technical lawyer you are not even the game and that applies for the firm as a whole so technical excellence is a given but i've seen uh, just as i've seen the history of the profession and i've been uh, around for 42 years in the practice of which 25 as a leader what we see today as the indian legal profession is vastly different from what it was earlier i call this the current modern indian legal profession since basically since 91 92 after those reforms because the manner in which 
transactional practice kind of evolved and also how law firms and professional organizations are structured changed dramatically. So there is to an extent an element of the business of law as well because we are large commercial organization. We are over a thousand lawyers uh, and many other uh, support staff as well. So this by any chance is, uh, by any count is a, is a fairly big enterprise. So the kind of professionalism that comes and which you learn over time uh, in terms of how to manage such a large enterprise and it's very different from how you manage a corporate. I think manage a professional service organization involves a very different set of uh, human skills. There are a thousand lawyers means you have a thousand egos, you have a thousand aspirations as well and dealing with each one of them. The command and control structure doesn't work yeah. as well. So that's the, that's the difference. I think it's a very difficult job, but it's also a very exciting job because whether people stay with you long term or not, you actually change their life forever. And that's a very satisfying feeling as well and i can you know as i we i actually did a count of this uh, two years ago uh, and we i noted that you know in about just the last 20 years 10000 lawyers have we have touched their lives uh, over 10000 lawyers in terms of whether it's an internship or whether it's a uh, it's an associate or partners or other so many people and they make up our alumni today yeah. uh, and that's great it's it's a it's almost like a i call it the amachan university I'm also curious about how you think about people. You know, you mentioned you have over a thousand lawyers in the company and how managing a legal services firm is very different from, you know, a business company in that sense. But previously you also said how they're both very similar at the foundational level. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how you think about people and how they are different and similar, the legal services versus so I think the, the, the professional services um, and particularly lawyers have been described as insecure overachievers. Uh, and that's the very nature of the beast. Uh, but they're also very fun people. They're always uh, questioning. Uh, you have to convince them firstly at a professional level through their intellect and their mind. But at a human level, you have to deal with them uh, through the heart and through, uh, through emotion as well. So they are undoubtedly more complex. They work very hard. We are one of the most hardworking profession. Um, I mean, maybe a little less than the medical profession, but almost there because it's, it's very demanding. And um, uh, what also happens is you take other people's problems and make them your own. And you keep stressing about them because you have to find the right answer as well. And that kind of weighs you down. So in, a, in our industry, uh, mental health issues and burnout is a very high proportion compared to a lot of the others. And that's been commented on widely as well. So that's, I think, the, the kind of uniqueness of, uh, of lawyers. But now that being said, uh, I think we are also great innovators and great thinkers in terms of what is the foundations of society. I mean, even if you look at the history of our nation, Gandhiji was a lawyer, Jawaharlal Nehru was a lawyer, Vallabhai Patel was a, uh, was a lawyer, and these were they had practiced for a while as well. And if you look at in the U.S., uh, Abraham Lincoln, and there's so many. Barack Obama uh, had a legal education. So it kind of that that training equips you for public policy, and I think it equips you and makes you constantly aware of. What is it that makes society work? Which is a very different understanding and skill set from, say, a entrepreneurial organization whose sole objective is, say, to earn profits. Whereas in the legal services, you also get to learn a lot more about public policy, society, and the humanities. And oh, absolutely, I mean that not, not to um, undermine what businesses oh, no, no, do as well, yeah, but yeah. yeah, we are different. We are different, and I think we contribute in terms of our kind of intellect and philosophy uh, a lot to nation building. Over the years, you know, you were talking about your journey and some of the insights you've gathered along the way. One of the things I like to think about is that skills compound. They take time, but they compound exponentially. And the next 10 years for you, or for that matter, for anybody who's been in an industry for so long, are going to be exponentially better than the previous 10, right? It's going to add up. Which skills do you think will compound 
and people should focus on, especially in the legal services industry uh, earlier on. Yeah, I think uh, speaking personally for myself and then I'll generalize it to the profession, uh, I think it depends on kind of what life stage you are on. So I'm in my mid 60s. Uh, and at this point, I think the, uh, the sort of inner motivations are about giving back to society. I mean, the firm is doing very well, running uh, is running and obviously I need to intervene from time to time, but it's a steady ship. But uh, in terms of what personally drives me now, I think is uh, not only giving back to society in general, but also having a big impact uh, on the structure of the uh, legal profession as well. And we should talk about that in terms of what perhaps even my wish list from the new government uh, is going to be. Um, because one of the biggest things I think is a reform of the legal system and the legal profession. But we should have a separate uh, question on that. Absolutely. In fact, would love to understand that in more detail as, yeah, we, as we, we talk about that. You know, I, I like to think of law, of the, the law as code. And there is good code and bad code. And I think what you said right now about the reform of the legal system is a very good transition into that area. And something that I also was thinking about previously is that what makes good code, and what makes bad code? Because ultimately code is just a generalization of specifics, constraints, and things written out which you want to be enacted in a particular fashion. What is good law? What is good code? So that's a very deep question. Uh, but let me sort of go back to perhaps, uh, at least in Western thinking, uh, of what were the origins of, of law. And different people could pin a different point of time. But in my opinion, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the tablets, uh, with the Ten Commandments, that was probably the first time that the world got law of how should man live. And of course, when he saw his people before him and he was so enraged that he threw the tablets and, and they broke, which raises a very interesting question that the, the frustrations uh, are about how law is implemented and about how people behave even when you show them the way. And that's a good metaphor for what we face today as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with our laws today. I think a lot of the problem that society faces today is because of bad implementation or bad characters in the system who abuse what the law is. So your question on good law, bad law. Uh, so the the the, code, the word code, I think, is derived from codex, which is the the uh, the the wax on the husk of a uh, on the basket of the of a tree. And it, it, it's an important message there, which is that you need to be flexible in terms of how you can you can write uh, on the bark of the tree, but also the hardness of the tree underneath it. And that's how the word code got developed. Now, of course, we use it for computers as well. So to answer specifically answer your question on what is good code and bad code, I think the principles of code should be clear and there's a hardness to it, but at the same time, it should be malleable. And it should be flexible to move with the times and to deal with different situations. And there are many, many metaphors that have been used. But, uh, you know, some of them are the kind of what's called the five P's and the three A's. Uh, it must be purpose driven. It must be precise. It must be preemptive. It must be proportionate. What we're seeing today in a lot of the rulemaking that is coming out uh, in India and elsewhere is it's disproportionate. I, call, I recently called it, you know, shooting uh, sparrows with cannons uh, as well. So there is an element of proportionality involved as well. And in terms of uh, really how do you actually make it work in society, I think it has to be not only flexible, there must be a kind of an aesthetic element to how you uh, implement uh, the law as well. Because it's at the end of the day, uh, all laws will affect people and it affects uh, humanity as well. So there has to be that human touch um, to it as well. And a lot of the laws are kind of missing that element today. Uh, it's interesting for India at this point of time, because there's one thing that has happened in the last 10, 15 years, is we are moving from a relationship-based society to a rule-based society. And that happens with when an when a economy grows and when a kind of a nation almost reinvents itself, and we are doing that now. I think I don't need to uh, tell you I mean, that what's actually happening in India. It's, it's, it's a new India that's emerging. 
and is now moving to it will head towards a developed economy the rule of law and the legal foundations are going to be absolutely critical for that we will not be a developed economy without a good legal system i i really like the answer and the articulation that good law or good code has to be well grounded but also has to be malleable and how that ties into the legal foundations of the new india that we are entering i'm also curious and that naturally begs the question of the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law right there are naturally many loopholes that would arise in any such kind of situation where the principles are clear but the spirit is buried how do you think about that so this is a perennial debate of principle based laws or rule based uh, laws and india hasn't found that balance yet we keep toggling between the two uh the kind of bureaucracy if i can say comes up with rule based policy and law but intends it to be principle based the moment somebody actually finds a loophole to say oh you violated the principle of it so we there and and the foundation of that is that there is a trust deficit between the state and the policy environment and the subject of uh, of the law whether it's a private citizen or some commercial enterprise as well so it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game that is going on so at some point philosophically and of course depending on the subject we have to be very clear about are we creating a culture of a principle based system or a rule based system eventually the gold standard i think is a principle based system where everybody in society understands what the purpose of a law is and then abides by that but today it the, the the culture for a long time has been that if it's not forbidden it's permitted and it's uh, better to say sorry than to ask for permission now that is changing as well because of this migration towards a more rule based society and the fear of arbitrary enforcement sometimes is making people kind of not understand what is happening and defaulting much more to a uh, permission based culture and that permission based culture becomes a problem if you don't get the answer you are basically told figure it out for yourself you know you mentioned about the purpose of cyril amarchand mangaldas is to create the, the finest lawyers, lawyers the finest lawyers the finest lawyers for a just world in this letter versus spirit debate you know ultimately justices when both converge how do you embody this principle of justice in this context that's a great question uh and we keep struggling with what the right uh, answer is because sometimes uh the commercial imperatives um overpower uh the justice element of it but you know in the profession generally as a generalization we can't sit in judgment over our clients uh we as human beings we can judge each other but as practitioners once you accept a client however uh, problematic the client could be we can't sit and judge them and we can't impose our notions of justice uh, upon them but i think what we can do is to ensure that in terms of how we conduct our professional business that we bring fairness transparency you are always even if you are an opponent on a on a matter or in a litigation you will always be trusted so the kind of fairness and the ethics that you bring to uh, to and we are a profession we are not a business we, th- that is the fundamental uh, core value that i think we do and i think we imbi- in in this firm we imbibe it in each of our lawyers from the day of their induction we have for any new lawyer joining the firm there is a seven day induction actually in this very room or i mean if the 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 cohort is wider we do it outside and there is a deep ingraining of these values secondly how we do our business on a day to day matter as well and uh, there are many metaphors that we use but the one which uh, i like is um, using mythology uh, i don't know if you heard of the four quadrants so all indian mythological characters and in terms of how we actually decide on where we get into gray situations is there are four quadrants there is the ravana quadrant there is which is bad in spirit and in form you know, run away with somebody's wife and all of that then there is duryodhan who is bad in spirit but the form was okay i mean yeah he won the game of dice and all of that as well you can't fault him on process you can fault him on the spirit 
Then there is of course the extremely good one, which is Ram, which is good in form and good in spirit. And then there's Krishna. Uh, of course, I mean, he was very mischievous in terms of how he conducted his film. So what we teach our people is try to be in the Rama quadrant on your advice, but if not, at least default to the Krishna quadrant. <laughs> so this is how, and that is how our, um, the, and this is folklore in the yeah. firm. I mean, any, every induction and every way I tell them this, that ye do quadrant ke bahar mat jao, because a lot of people sometimes are, you know, giving Duryodhan type advice. Uh, so that this is where, and then I use another metaphor as well, that if you're a counsel, be more like Krishna, not like Vidur. So Vidur was, of course, the chief advisor, like you are in, in, in a, and he saw the Vastra Haran, but he just stood up, expressed his opinion and sat down. Okay. Whereas Krishna actually did something about it because he sort of just made sure that there was, uh, you know, endless miles of saris that came through. Very often what today's lawyers do is just give their opinion and sit down okay. without guiding the client what to do, right. guiding or helping. So the core of a, a merchant, a good hardcore Amarchan lawyer is that they have to be Krishna-like. That's quite an entertaining aside on Indian mythology and how that links to the legal system. I really love it to be in the Christian avatar, not just the Ram avatar, and definitely not go in the other two quadrants, the other two boxes. That's, that's quite incredible. I also want to talk about the legal system in India and particularly the legal infrastructure. And, you know, the natural narrative or trope is that law in India, of course, justice delayed is justice denied. One of the things that we were taught as kids. But I'm also curious about how there are so many cases, so few justices. And I think for a very well-developed economy, you do need a robust legal infrastructure, right? We see that in the U.S. And there, the legal system is sure has its own flaws, but from a third party perspective, perhaps it is very well developed. What do you think about the legal infrastructure in India, its system, its future? So there are, uh, there's a plus and there's a minus. I think the fact is that we have a sophisticated intellectual legal system. I think the quality of the final output that comes out is world class, no question. The judgments that come from our uh, senior judiciary uh, are as good as any that you would get in the world. The problem is what you just highlighted, uh, which is justice delayed is justice denied. And we've made so many attempts through alternate dispute resolutions and all of that. And, you know, uh, a leading jurist recently said that if you want to make in India, you first have to figure out how you will resolve in India. If you can't resolve in India, you make in India. And I think there's a lot of truth in that because today what we do is export it to Singapore and here and there and others. But how do you create the confidence in not only foreign investors, but also Indian businesses that no matter what happens, in every business situation, there will be some conflict and there will be something that needs to be resolved. But whether you have an efficient system, or not to resolve it, I think is a is a huge area of of risk, and it is particularly high uh, in India. Now, I have three answers to three things that need to be done, uh, and I'll first deal with them in brief. I think first we need there needs to be a deep focus in terms of just the laws that have been written, because the problem starts with ambiguous laws, and the quality of many of them, you know, leave a lot to be desired. Ironically, it's some of the older laws from, you know, pre-independent that still kind of rule the, the roost and, and have survived the test of time. So, but that aside, I think, you know, they have to also move with the time. So, my first point is we need to have better law making uh, and whether that is legislation or delegated legislation or rules or, you know, policies put out by independent regulators. So, that's point number one. The second is the judicial system. We need to figure out how to get quick justice. And I think at least in part, technology is the answer. Uh, and many nations have kind of moved towards it. I think uh, the, uh, the delays are not just because of judicial bandwidth. That of course is an issue, but a lot of the judicial bandwidth is clogged up by process. A lot of that process could be taken over by technology as well. So I think we can land up saving a lot of judicial bandwidth and time 
if we use technology wisely and that's going to involve a lot of investment and i think the third point is that the legal profession needs to be reformed drastically i mean the chief justice also last year made a speech mentioned that the legal profession is today is an old boys club uh it has it should be kind of open to all uh, but it is not so i think three things need to be done there one is i think the market needs to open up i think we need to open it up to foreign competition uh because I, it's become a joke in, uh, internationally you know every time an international lawyer sees me and you know talks to me uh, he says you know yeah it's still two years away right you know and that joke has been going on for 20 years uh, or more so i think the first thing and it should be done in a fair and transparent way i mean we've had a number of botched up attempts to open up the profession and that's not going to happen that Why way is it, not up? it has not opened up because it's just been botched up. there's no clarity it's a conversation of the deaf uh, where there is and I, we don't even know who is taking that decision so there needs to be maybe a committee needs to or a commission needs to be put in place to figure it out the until we open up this profession to international competition of best in class we are still going to remain a cottage industry i i'm firmly of the view that we need more competition because what has happened is that uh just in this kind of you can't be the top country one of the top economies in the world without access to uh, global legal services is not possible you're not going to create that confidence today has become a protection racket i mean in terms of all the uh, you know the the lawyers associations and others it's nothing but a protection racket so that's point number 1 secondly i think the business model needs to be allowed we are the only profession or industry which is forced into a partnership model i think it's time that we should be allowed to look at a corporate model because uh, yes it is a profession yes it's not a business but i think that the fact is that because there is also the element of business of law there is a need for access to capital for example if we are to embrace big technology where is all that capital going to come from and only a corporate model will allow that secondly just that business model in a, in a pure general partnership model is basically a cash flow and it's become a labor arbitrage you are not really creating more long term value uh, and, and, and we are too small for that and i think the third which will happen because it's still not developed globally but it should happen over here it is a commercial model needs to change the core for the last 100 years has been what's called the hourly rate model you charge for time but the question is for, uh, does that really represent the value of what you get uh and it doesn't and it creates the wrong incentives it creates the incentive that why don't you just take your time over it and multiply the number of hours so you will make more money it the philosophy has to move towards more value based uh, compensation and ai is going to force that because you will get an answer out of ai in a matter of seconds how are you going to charge for that so these three things need to fundamentally change i think somebody should look at it and revamp this profession from top to bottom otherwise i think we are headed towards a big problem here it's very interesting you say especially the third thing in the third point you mentioned about how incentives need to change and i think one of the things that you also talked about in one of your other speeches was how you created the incentives innovatively when you were building the firm could you talk a bit about that yeah so i the mind goes back to uh, i think the year 99 2000 and it was about 7 8 years after the liberalization yeah. there was nothing like a career track uh partnership sizes were like there used to be a ceiling of 20 partners so what do you tell a young partner or a young lawyer who wants to start up that wait for somebody to die then there will be a vacancy and that is exactly what used to happen at that time so long story short we actually worked with a leading international consultant and changed by creating a role model and that is when the modern legal profession began of creating career tracks reforming the partnership model the compensation model and what you see today was the journey that we started at that time amar chand led that way let's talk about your annual note you know the annual note that you send out to the entire firm every year one line from that particularly struck me and i have this over here to conduct the orchestra one has to first turn one's back to the crowd could you talk about that yeah i think the visual is kind of very clear and i kind of look at this uh, visual 
regularly in terms of how I should focus. And there's a kind of a Gita-esque element okay. to it as well. Because it comes to the kind of defining line of, uh, of Gita, Karma Nyavadika Raste. Yeah. It basically says you focus on your work, you know, don't focus on the fruits. And what this, this other metaphor indicates is that don't bother about all the noise that is going on and don't do stuff just for audience applause. Focus on your people, focus on the quality of the music that is being produced by the orchestra. Today what happens because social media, everything is about how many likes did you get? which is the noise in the system. And for a leader who, again, the metaphor of the conductor of the orchestra, it is a very lonely place, firstly. I mean, any kind of form of leadership is very lonely. And there is a lot of noise. So you have to, no matter what type of organization you lead, you will always get a lot of white noise and you will get a lot of conflicting opinions. How do you cut through all that and take your own call? And that can only happen when you start ignoring all that noise and start using your own inner music. Yeah. I, I love that metaphor. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be with me for a, for a long time. I want to also transition and switch gears and talk about a bit of the fun stuff. You know, we've talked about the legal infrastructure, the legal system, building Amar Chand, and so many other things. I, I want to talk a bit about the day-to-day -day of being in the law and add a fun element, to add a fun element to it, I'd love to get your thoughts in a few quick answers. So, what's the most, expi what's the most exciting part of being in the law? So, uh, it's dealing with people. I love dealing with the talent in the firm and I also love talking to clients. I mean, we came to know each other professionally. I mean, it's been so, so much fun. Yeah. So, a, a lot of my fun is comes from people sure. and uh, and the learning that comes with that every time you meet somebody new you learn something from them which kind of stays with you and there are of course lots of other answers uh, to the fun element as well but what i really enjoy about uh, about the law is the people whom i meet both internally and externally and linked with that is the problems that we solve so fundamentally lawyers uh, you know if we were all kids we would be that kid who is solving puzzles. <laughs> That's our job. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You take on a client and the client has a good case or a bad case. What in your view is a good strong case and a bad not so strong case? Yeah, inherently in your question is a kind of a adversarial element yeah. to it. Of course, there are, there are transactions also, but I'll come to that. So, uh, for, I come back to what I said a little earlier of we can't be judgmental about the goodness or the badness of the That's case. Right. The, it's two things, two, three things. One is for me when I personally look at it and different lawyers will have different answers. It's the quality of the outcome. It's secondly, uh, you know, can it, can it help in improve somebody's life in terms of the fairness of the output that can you get people justice? Uh, again, this is kind of a more from a litigation lens. From a, when if I were to put on my hat as a, corp, a commercial lawyer, I think the answer would be a little, did I get the best outcome that I could for my client without compromising on the essential? Because in a commercial transaction, there's a lot of give and take. So did you help in advising the client wisely in terms of what should be the trade-offs that they should make and how to view things in SSO? I, I find myself very often, not just as a lawyer, but also as a little bit of a therapist. Uh, very often when you're advising your clients or a kind of almost like a philosophical advisor of, you know, ye aapke liye achha nahi hai because of ABC reasons. I remember when you mentioned to somebody, I want to be your friend, not your lawyer. And that's sort of aligns with what you're saying. Going off of that, what's a good lawyer and what makes a, lack of a better word, bad lawyer? So technical excellence should be a given for any kind of lawyer. Otherwise, you know, you shouldn't be in the profession. But I think uh, for me personally, it is that who places the client's interests above his own. And I have demonstrated that in many points of time in my life. And we have situations, particularly when families are involved, I always try to find a solution and get peace. Whereas if we provoke them into a fight, they could go on for years. We learn a lot of money. But is that the right answer for, uh, for the client? So always putting what the client's best interests are above your own commercial interests, I think makes a great lawyer. And which is where the redesigning of the incentives is important. 
but a lot of it comes from your personal philosophy as well because there are lots of excellent lawyers but who sometimes place their own interests above uh, so it's not just about you know knowledge it is about really your values one of the things you said was how when you take on a client it's not the lawyer's job to judge the merits of the case or the client for that matter and in law you have to deal with facts you have to create conviction you have to develop opinions and then you have to persuade another person yeah. i'm curious about with this background or foundation of you not judging the client how do you develop conviction opinion with the conflicting sets of facts and beliefs I think there are many aspects. One is, of course, diligence and thoroughness. Uh, you know, ninety-nine percent of a lawyer's job is to be thorough, and you have to be diligent. You, you or your team should have read every piece of paper yeah. that there is, and, and and looked at every fact, because what you are paid for is to uh, first just be thorough, and you can't miss a thing. You can't go into a case and you know find that you have not looked at a particularly important document. So I think that is kind of one. the second i think is then to use your uh, uh, use your both mind and heart in order to find the right instinct about a lot of most things are in the gray and you therefore have to use professional judgment and i will answer in kind of non professional situations i have a slightly different toolkit yeah. but in a professional toolkit you also have to bring to bear your instinct what's the difference between a good counsel and a not so good counsel it is their instinct and on the same problem you can go to 10 lawyers they will all come to it from a slightly different viewpoint so uh, you use your own personal value system your knowledge your experience apply it to a common set of facts and that's when that's an art so there's a both a science and an art to it and um, again just to uh, your question on how do you form opinions i think it is a combination of curiosity diligence and instinct and it almost sounds like you know there are these two kinds of mindset the soldier mindset and the scout mindset and it sounds like what you're talking about is to be the scout not the soldier to have that yeah. curiosity diligence and thoroughness in terms of wanting to know everything you know one of the things you said was that we're moving from a relationship based country to a rule based society and that happens as a transition across economies in your letter your 2020 note you talked about how we need to move from dhanda to rishta and thinking of your business as a relationship business any thoughts on that that's a very deep question again uh, and, and this is what our sort of our personal belief system and when you've been around for as long as we have what do i mean i look back what what is it that's re- my real uh, wealth it is relationships i mean having been with so many you know clients and businesses over such a long time you develop a relationship that goes beyond business and where you actually bond with people you kind of share their pain and pleasure as well and that is what a law firm is an idea and it's an idea that is made up of many types of intangibles one of which is its relationship capital so relationship capital i think is the deepest capital uh, that you can have uh, and uh, this is something which i uh, regularly kind of talk to the lawyers in the firm is don't have a transactional approach to a client you keep up the relationship some day it will result in business but don't pursue it you know a relationship is actually very valuable for its own sake as well wo kabhi dhanda aaya nahi aaya doesn't matter if it comes that's great that's a bonus but don't build a relationship only for the purposes of uh for for monetary gain because firstly people see through that yeah. and that's not what they value if you want them to trust you in their most difficult problems it will be because of the relationship not because of commerce yeah. going off of that in your note you also talked about buddhi and kala yeah. and just now you talked about how it's an art and a science and of course today's zeitgeist is artificial intelligence and you talked about how judicial processes which take up a lot of time most of them can also be automated using technology and i'm assuming that also includes artificial intelligence in the age of ai and tech especially when 
looking up case laws has become ever so easy and so on and so forth. What is the value add if we are to move from an hourly rate to you know, a value-based idea? What is the value add of a legal professional and how can young aspiring lawyers develop that? So I think you and I both know that we are sitting on a on almost a tipping point in the evolution of technology. Probably the next 12 to 24 months, it is estimated that AI will become more powerful than human intelligence. And that's both an exciting and a scary thought. Uh, because at that point, without the kind of emotional value system, which machines will not have, yeah. uh, you, will, you will be able to create efficiency, but will you be able to create judgment? And when you come to lawyers like myself or my firm or you know other respected peers, you don't come only for efficiency, you come for judgment as well. And that's the difference between what I call Kala, Vidya and uh, Buddhi. So what will become the premium, uh, pre premium ingredient is going to be the Buddhi. Yeah. Where you are actually able to, to, to tell a client, you know, all the evidences in this, all the, the math tells you you must do it, but don't do it. This is not right. And that is something that AI can just not. It just cannot have it. Yeah, yeah. And I actually, in a different context, I use like three types of uh, expressions in terms of what you could be. You could be just a lawyer. Yeah. You could be a trusted advisor. And the ultimate is you're a client whisperer. Client whisperer. whisperer. Yeah, whereas, you know, you actually can tell whisper in the clients <laughs> here and say, ye mat karo. And he actually, yeah. that that's the most valuable part for a client. Yeah. For ye, because they also get confused. Yeah. Ye karna, nahi karna. Somebody's telling them do this, somebody's telling them do that. But the value of that whisper is uh, what makes all the difference. This has been great to talk about. I now want to switch gears and talk a bit about the macro things as well and get your thoughts on that. You know, elections are just around the corner and we don't do politics, but I'd love to understand from your view the role and future of services in the evolving India, in a new India, in the Amrit Kal of India, as you know, the philosophy has it. No, we are in probably one of the most exciting phases of our post-independence history. Uh, and I think it's kind of universally acknowledged now that this is India's moment. You hear, you know, references to whether it's India's decade or it's India's century. But there is common consensus that India is on the rise. And when it is on the rise and there is so much that is going on in terms of economic activity and social upliftment, I think you have to pay attention to one key aspect of the core infrastructure, which is the rule of law. And the rule of law itself comprises many things. The, the, the black letter law that is written, how justice is done and disputes are resolved, and how the profession functions at an international level. So I, I truly believe that the legal system broadly, which covers all of these uh, uh, concepts, is a very hard part of the core. It, it seems like a soft issue. It's actually a hard issue. It's a very core part of the infrastructure of the country. And I think due attention needs to be paid, uh, paid to that. So my advice to the, the new government, whichever it is, uh, when they come to power, is to make this one of the top three priorities uh, of just, in whichever way we land out, just refresh the system, make it more just and more efficient as well. That, if, if you look at things, you know, 100 years from now or 200 years from now, if there is one thing that we will be remembered for this period, I think it is the reform that we will make to the broader rule of law topic, because that is when you can authentically say, yes, we are now a developed country. And you can never be a developed country just because you have the best roads or the best airports or the best factories if you don't have a legal system to match. Sounds like you're pretty vocal and pretty, you're playing the statesman-like role for leading or influencing this change in legal reform and legal infrastructure in India, which is a very different state and position to be in than to just say practice law as part of or leading a legal services firm, which I find quite intriguing and interesting. You know, Bono has this saying that in order to serve an age, you have to betray it first. And I think time and again, seems like 
from your vantage point, you've done that. Uh, could you talk a bit about how and why that matters to you? Yeah, I think and this has been a core part of our business practice and, and strategy since the last you know two, three decades of at any given point of time, we have a disruptive mindset. Uh, because the only way in which you can bring change and unless you're constantly embracing change, you can't serve an age. Otherwise, you become stagnant and at some point you atrophy and, and die. And that takes me to this very profound sentence from Bono, which actually is part of the firm's folklore of in order to serve an age, you have to betray it first uh, as well. And that's a kind of a disruptor's mindset. And we have a very strong disruptor's mindset. If you notice the strap line on our firm's logo is also ahead of the curve. And in that is embedded disruption. How, how have you disrupted? What have you disrupted? So many things, I think just first in terms of the talent model, the, te the technology model that we're constantly sort of experimenting with. Him. The approach that we have brought to uh, to client service as well. Many, many things. In term it's not for no reason, A, that we have survived this long, yeah. and B, that just in terms of how people think of us, uh, in terms of a trusted advisor, it's, I think it comes as a result of all of that. We spend a lot of time and money and investment and energy on knowledge as well. So uh, that's just basically running our practice well. But more importantly, I mean, at the personal level, I take an interest in a lot of uh, public policy issues uh, and, and just sort of trying to advise policymakers and the state on all of that. And I think it kind of all adds up. It's a lot of small, small things yeah. uh, uh, which, are, which are distinct, but they all add up to a disruptive mindset. And what I like most about just going back to another gear in this conversation so far about how you want more competition in the legal services industry, which is quite interesting because you want it for the betterment of the entire profession, as well as for the entire profession to just evolve into a new era. Yes, and I think before that, I would place the country first because for a economy, if you want to be a 30 trillion uh, economy, how on earth can you even imagine that we will get there without a legal system to match? It's just the two just don't add up. Resolve in India before. Resolve in, there's so many uh, dimensions to it, just in terms of the efficiencies. And we are, we are unlike China, because China's rule of law, I won't comment upon, but we are far more, inter, far more liberal as a, uh, as a society and uh, mindset. We, ha we have strong legal foundations. So I think we, we will need to fix this uh, before you fix anything else, or at least concurrently. This has been quite interesting. You know, we've talked about the micro and the nitty gritty aspects of the law and the overall general climate and the future of the legal infrastructure, legal reforms, and so on and so forth. I want to talk lastly just about two things which are a day in the life of <laughs> Mr. Sh Cyril Shroff and two, the skill sets that are required for a law 101 expertise. So maybe we'll start with a day in the life. So could you talk about that? So that's a very, that's a great question. So no two days are the same. <laughs> Every day is uh, is different, uh, but there are some common elements as well. Uh, I work hard because I like it, and I, I I wouldn't even call it work. I I enjoy working, so it's more fun. Uh, I'm sort of always, uh, even though I'm physically tired, I still feel mentally energized as well. So it's fundamentally a hard working day. Uh, and I, I just love what I do. Second, uh, I spend a lot of time in, in every day on a daily basis dreaming. I think very dreaming? Uh, dreaming about a, f a future, about the country, about you know everything that I love. I think it's very important to dream. If you don't dream, you can't do. Uh, so that uh, and every day, uh, you know, even when there is a mom, you know, if there is some half an hour in between two client meetings or. Others, what do you do? You actually just think about the future. So that's the second part. And again, not I'm not a boring person. So one of the things which I love to do is I, I, I follow pop culture a lot. I watch my Bollywood. In fact, right after this interview, I'm going for a movie. Uh, I, I love my music uh, and as well. So I think it's important to remain fresh on that side as well. So it's uh, th that's the second part. Spending time with uh, grandchildren is also uh, a huge stress buster. So that's the third part. And um, what do I enjoy the most of everything? I think is institution building. 
I think uh, more than actually being a lawyer, I enjoy building a legacy and building a long-term brand. Because we will all go at some point of time. What will survive? I think it's only the brand. That's that's quite touching, and it it shows uh, the human side that you know you do watch movies, you do spend oh, a lot. time with <laughs> your grandkids, you do you do have fun, and I think having that allows. I don't you... have too many friends, but I have very deep <laughs> friendships. <laughs> that's that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. And, and I think that allows you to understand people, build more relationships, and that's. And I'm important. basically a very deep introvert, and I actually think introverts, uh, they have themselves for company, yeah. so they, you never feel lonely. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I think being an introvert, introvert helps you to just be by yourself, and you know, Blaise. I enjoy Pascal, my own company. That's lovely. Blaise Pascal has this quote that you know all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability. To sit quietly in a room. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's that's what you you're you're saying over here, which is which is interesting. Um, I also want to talk a bit about the basic law 101. You know, you talked about if you don't have technical excellence, just don't even think about being in the game, right? And that's a very, in one sense, a suits esque, you know, Harvey Specter like you know mentality, which is which is probably true about the legal profession. Um, in business, we have accounting and a host of basic skill sets. For law to succeed, what are those? So there are actually, this is a very evolving subject and there are many, many new concepts that are coming around. And just on a kind of more fun note, to the two most recent ones that I've heard and which I like also are uh, first about a little, it's a little bit of a satire on PEP, P is profit per equity partner, which is traditionally how law firms can evaluate themselves. But the new version of it is uh, purpose, empathy, and people. So, a new, at least a, in a leadership position or a partnership position, your PEP should be one of these three. And the uh, one for uh, probably the associates and mid level lawyers is that you need to be an O shaped lawyer. Uh, you need to be optimistic, uh, you need to be original, um, you need to have uh, a lot of empathy as well and use your emotional uh, intelligence almost as much as you use uh, your uh, your IQ. And this is all true. I think we find that uh, very relevant in terms of uh, dealing with uh, with clients and just the, the ability to just rely and give technical advice without empathy for a client. A client wants to feel cared for as well. And, and I think the human part as well. So the O-shaped lawyer is kind of another new uh, innovation to that as well. But personally, uh, I think at least in terms of some of the basic skills and they will never change is that you need to be hardworking and very diligent. Uh, you need to be very genuine. Uh, I mean, the, if you want to build long-term relationships, you can have a short, you can be like a comet which just kind of fades out. Yeah. But if you want to be like a star that is there in the heavens for a long, long time, you need those long-term values. So there's no set of hard skills as such, apart from the technical excellence, which goes without saying. That's table stakes. That's table stakes. But I think what makes you, what makes a good lawyer into a great one is all these other things, the PEP and O-shaped mindset, which is which is what defines one. Yeah, and I think one thing which is entering into it, but I'm probably the wrong person to talk about it is uh, technology skills. I think it's becoming very important. Tech skills as a lawyer. Tech skills as a lawyer. So you know, there's, I think Alvin Toffler said it that, you know, the illiterate uh, of heart at 21st century will not be those who can't read and write, but they will be those who can't learn, unlearn and relearn. Yeah. And with the arrival of uh, of AI, that's what's going to be put on test. You know, our biggest competitor, I think, in future is not going to be another law firm or even international law firms. It's going to be an AI-enabled general counsel. He would probably come with something which uh, a machine has produced and say, can you please look at this for five minutes? Because it's probably been based on all the stuff that you have done in the past as well. And uh, AI produced it uh, for them. And now just have a look at it. This is our biggest competition for the future. That's that's quite interesting, especially after you saying that, you know, you love and want more competition. AI no, we have to read. So, you know, even when the first computers came, nobody went out of business. Yeah. You just have to learn new skills. And that's why what Toffler said of learn, unlearn and relearn. This has been an incredible conversation, Mr. Shroff. There's one last question that I want to ask you. You've talked about hard work, diligence, being curious, 
having the technical skills as stable stakes, the macro, the micro, the day in the life, the values, building institutions, and a lot more. If there's one perennial advice or lesson that you have learned over the years, which you think has tied to you through all the 40 years that you've been and the 107 years of Amar Chand, what would that be? Which is applic applicable not only to the general legal person, but to, to one and all. It's a very hard one to say any one thing, but my wife and I discuss this quite often and probably that one thing that stands out, and I'm thinking on the fly because we talk about it often, uh, is purity of purpose. So if you if you if you have purity of purpose, everything will work out. Define purity of purpose. Yeah, I mean, in, I gave you the firm purpose, even your own professional purpose or what you want to do. So long as you stay honest and in, you know committed to that at all times, no matter what you do, eventually you know life has a way of just kind of landing you in the right place. And you know, I think I've had a successful life. And I have a lot more to go. I'm not at all done as yet. Picture is <laughs> baki hai. Picture is baki hai, as they say. So, it's a, so long as I stick to this one principle of just being pure to my intent and my values and uh, and my purpose, everything will work out. There will be ups and downs, but I, I think I will land well. That's incredible. Thank you so much for this, Mr. Shroff. It's a, it was a pleasure speaking. Thank you, absolutely. And thanks for the great questions. <laughs> and uh, actually, you made me think a lot about myself. Thank you. Thank you.